Hello, this is Carolina, and this is the Unapologetically Joy podcast. It's time to embrace your essence and live your truth without regrets. Join us as we break free from societal constraints, soaring towards our authentic and empowered selves. With Joy as your guide, we'll dive deep into understanding what it means to be human, clearing away misconceptions, and discovering your true authentic self. Tune in to liberate your voice, discover your purpose, and become unapologetically you. So welcome, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come on my podcast. And before we start, I would like to introduce you to my listeners. This is Carolina, and she's a psychologist, an entrepreneur, a coach, and a motivational speaker. And I met her at a networking event, and she was doing a talk about uh, public speaking. And I thought it was uh, really interesting to invite her to the podcast. And uh, I would like to start to go back uh, to the uh, beginning of your career uh, because you grew up in Uruguay. And first you started working as a therapist. And I was wondering what inspired you to become a therapist? Nice. Good question. <laughs> Starting right in the deep end. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got inspired to be a therapist because I had an alcoholic uncle and I wanted to help him mm -hmm. and I didn't oh. know how. I noticed that like, I was always very sensitive in gr growing up, but then I had sort of a tough teenage upbringing and I became very closed off to, mm -hmm. to the sensitivity. But I was still mm -hmm. feeling everything, but I was denying it. So there was this internal conflict that I was constantly seeing things and feeling things and not being able to handle them properly. So that was an, one of the things that was influencing me to figure out what's, what's going on. And also the trigger was my uncle that I loved very dearly, but I could see how the whole family was suffering because of his alcoholism. Everybody was trying to get him to rehab and to get him to go to work and all of the, the different, like the basic things that, that you would want somebody for you that you love. Mm -hmm. And he was very stuck in his patterns and very stuck in his pain. So I was very inspired to help him and to relieve the pain of my family. Mm. So I think that was what actually trickled down into my decision of becoming a psychologist. I had two options, either become a plane pilot or a psychologist. Plane pilot is my dad's frustrated dream. So mm -hmm. there you go. No surprise there. And I could become a psychologist. That would be my own original thing. Still exciting mm -hmm. to me. And I went for psychologists to understand the family dynamics and to understand myself. Why do I feel so much and don't know what to do with it? Because mm -hmm. I, if you feel a lot, you know that something's wrong, but you don't have a framework or words to express it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels so recognizable because I had the same when I was growing up. Everybody was always saying, yeah, you're so sensitive and like a tough up, you know. Um, but I think it's a, a beautiful thing that you are so sensitive because you can experience life more intense, um, but you feel joy more and also feel the downside more. But yeah, I rather feel more sensitive than not sensitive, you know, and I also recognize that you feel so overwhelmed that you actually close yourself off. And that's what I also heard uh, when I was young, like... Um, you're not sensitive. You don't have any emotions, but that's not true. You actually have too much emotions, you know, it's like exploding. Um, so that's really re recognizable. But did you help your uncle, uh, at the end? He passed away when I was on the, the first six months of studying. So oh. it didn't get to, I didn't get to fill, like, fulfill that wish, but mm -hmm. It's all right. I don't think I could have. 
most of the times within your family, you're not the right person to do it. You you could maybe act a little better, maybe not be an enabler, maybe give a bit of a, advice, but the person that can help your family is usually a neutral third party. Yeah. And how, how did you deal with the sensitivity uh, when you were growing up? When I was very little, I would spend a lot of time alone. And then that would be very nice. It was not by choice. I, I wanted to have friends and I wanted to hang out with people. But I lived pretty far off from the school that I was in. And um, I was mostly being taken care of by my grandparents. So I would just be in the patio of the house and uh, spend time with butterflies and bees and worms. And I got really attuned with nature and the rhythms of nature. And in nature, everything is subtler, except when there's a tornado or a tsunami. But in general, everything is a bit more subtle. So in order to be attuned to what's going on, you have to bring yourself to that frequency. And that's, I think, what naturally made me more sensitive. And then as I was growing up, I had, like, my dad is a boomer. I love him to death, but he's a boomer and he's a person that never expressed properly his emotions or was not allowed. He was not permitted by contract because he's a man and he shouldn't express emotions. But he would lash out a lot and he would be very critical of me and tell me hurtful things growing up. And that's what actually was also helpful to attune more to my sensitivity before I shut it down in my teenage years, because I would know when my dad was about to be triggered. I would know what I needed to do in order for my dad not to lash out or to be, be hurtful with his words. So the anticipating of his attack would actually make me more sensitive and make me read better people. Also with my mom, like I could read her really well, not consciously, of course, because it's just a survival mechanism. When you're a little kid, you don't have, again, a framework to understand what you're doing. But I would feel when something was wrong. I would feel when somebody was about to get triggered and I would anticipate to that either by removing myself from the situation or appeasing the other person. And that's where my people pleasing started. <laughs> <laughs> That's the origin of the story. But at the same time, it was also sensitivity. The reading in relationship, reading the other person so I can anticipate myself to whatever's coming next. Mm -hmm. And I think those two combinations, being in touch with nature and reading people as a survival strategy was what made me attuned more and more to my sensitivity. I think I was born sensitive, but that that was what sharpened the knife, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also believe that if you uh, before you come to this earth, you choose your parents to learn some lessons. Do you also feel the same? Yes, I think mm -hmm. uh, we choose the adventure that is mm -hmm. going to take us to the the highest possible evolution of our soul. Mm -hmm. And that origin in Uruguay, even though it was a bit tough, a bit lonely. It gave me a lot of the ingredients that now I need to mm -hmm. pursue my dreams and to become a speaker and to become a business person. So, so I do appreciate the whole, the whole road. And I know that my parents, even though they, it was their first time, I was their first child. And honestly, they were struggling. Like they, they're human and they were struggling. They were lower middle class working all day and always struggling to make ends meet. So I have a lot of compassion and love towards them while simultaneously holding a lot of compassion and love to the little girl that didn't get all her needs met or wasn't, wasn't having the best time of her life, which is me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to heal our inner child and that's really hard uh, because we also have to go through the, um, the dark side of us and accept mm -hmm. it. Uh, because yeah like you said sensitivity can be a really plus but um yeah you can also get overwhelmed sometimes but 
yeah, it's just how life is, you know. And I also accepted myself that I'm I'm just like this, you know, and can uh, do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And as a psychologist, I would say I love the dark side. That's it's oh, weird okay. to say. It's weird to say, but you know how how there's those people that are really passionate about insects or really passionate about mushrooms, and they know everything about it. Um, I love the dark side of the human nature. And I also love accepting it in myself. That's one of Carl Jung's principles. He's a Swiss psychologist. Well, used to be, he died a long time ago. One of uh, Freud's disciples, but not really because he was very controversial. And he, he was the one that coined the term shadow, working with the shadow, the thing that's not in the light. And he would say that if you want to be whole, you need to go through the individuation process, which is accepting every part of yourself, even the parts that we would normally reject or exile, because I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be manipulative. I don't want to be this person that bails out when things get tough. But if that's you, then you have to accept it in order to integrate it in yourself and then eventually move on from it. But the first step is to see it. And the second step is to integrate it. And then the third step is to evolve from it. And I think we always want to jump that, that stage of integrating and accepting mm -hmm. the dark side of, of us. But the most whole people on the planet, the people that I admire the most, have seen their shadow, have played with their demons, had been in the deep end of the pool and like in the biggest shithole you can imagine they saw themselves in that split in that space they saw themselves as a greedy person or as a needy person and they were able to love that part of themselves as well and be mm -hmm. compassionate towards it accept mm -hmm. it integrate it and then from there emerge back into the light with a greater wholeness so i think in my career and in my personal life, I am a, a, yeah, a very big enthusiast of, of darkness because the more darkness we embrace, the more whole we become. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And I also feel like some pe so many people are so attached to the results. Um, and I really feel like life is all about ups and downs, you know, and also having success, you know, it's it's not like, uh, linear line you know it's not uh, one goal and I'm here and I need to go there and just one line you know you, you have so many ups and downs you have to accept you know and that's what I really needed to learn when I was becoming an entrepreneur um, because I thought okay I'm just gonna start my own business and I'm happy and but um, yeah you have to work on your limiting beliefs for example mm -hmm. um, and traumas and so many things. Yeah. And that's where meeting the darkness can help you move forward because you won't move forward if you don't root yourself enough. What you, the, I think the analogy is, I said it wrong, but for a tree to grow really tall, your roots need to be very, very grounded and very attached to the ground. So when we move forward, we cannot in business there's there's this usual belief that says well the the systems and processes that got you to 10k a month won't get you to 100k a month you need to evolve mm -hmm. you need to make a quantum jump in your consciousness in order to get to the next level mm -hmm. and that's w what's blocking you from the 10k like from the 10k to the 100k is mindset and it's usually mm -hmm. that Nobody in your family did it before. You don't know how that feels. You don't have the know-how. And probably you have a lot of beliefs around it that money is bad or that money will transform you or make you evil or give you too much responsibility, whatever it is. And then all of those things need to be addressed in order for you to be clean and integrated to move forward to the next mm -hmm. phase. And it's not like you integrate this once and then you're good to go, whatever, and until the infinite. Every level of existence that you have, 
every level of existence you inhabit is like, okay, now I'm going into the, the having a job and just being a good girl and getting married and just buying a house. That's, mm -hmm. that's level one of existence where you are just complying. And then if you want to get out of that, you need to make a consciousness jump. And then you go to the next one. Well, I'm following my purpose and I have a job that is unconventional. And then you want to be extra successful. So then you have to make another mm -hmm. jump of consciousness and so on and so forth. But every jump requires a greater integration of yourself and thorough cleaning of your beliefs and all the shadow aspects that have been neglected up until this moment because it was fine you don't you don't need to have great money mindset if you have just a normal job and you're fine with being stable and that's it but if you want to make 100k a month you you have to have a flawless money mindset mm -hmm. so that's i think that's mm -hmm. that's where where i would say is like yeah there's levels to the game and the higher you want mm -hmm. to go in the levels the cleaner the more impeccable with your integration you have to be mm, yeah mindset is so important in business and um, i think also uh, mindset for me it was also like um, a thing because i started my business but i was not working on my mindset and that is like the first step i guess before you even start a business and um, i also would like to go back uh, to the time you were a therapist you started working as a therapist uh, did you begin to start as uh, as an entrepreneur or did you first uh, work in corporate or work for a boss uh, what did you do i worked in corporate for a couple of years mm -hmm. not my jam no <laughs> i was I, like i went in with a mm -hmm. blissful ignorance as i would call it and i started very enthusiastic i'm gonna i'm gonna make it in corporate i'm gonna climb the ladder and within a year i had a team of 22 people and I was the team lead and I was the project manager. Mm -hmm. And then at some point the company needed to cut costs. This is like a big IT company and they needed to cut costs for the summer and they would rehire people then next year. So they had this, this HR policies that were pretty bad and they started cutting off people from my team. And mm -hmm. then I got really protective of my people. So I couldn't, mm -hmm. In my heart of hearts, I couldn't disregard the human aspect in the benefit of the greater thing, which was the corporate interest. So I actually got into arguments with my managers and I was like, well, but there has to be ways. Like you're not even exploring ways of keeping the people around and you're just like, kicking them off. They have a family. Like I was just... Yeah. Insane. I was a revolutionary mm -hmm. person disguised as a corporate person. And um yeah, it, it took two weeks before I, I quit. I couldn't I couldn't. Like they fired, I think, five members of my team. And each of them I was talking to and I was holding them as they would face this uncertain future. And I was like, I cannot do this. This is not this is not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to, to be part of this machine, of this mm -hmm. corporate, whatever it is. And luckily, it was around the time where I graduated. I was working full time and studying my, my bachelor's. And in Uruguay, the bachelor's is five years. And then when you emerge, you're a licensed psychologist. So you can already start. Mm -hmm. It's not like everywhere else that you do a bachelor's and a master's. So I did that. And also I did a postgraduate certification in cognitive behavioral therapy because I needed something more practical mm -hmm. to help people out. And I finished working in the corporate and a couple of months later, I was working as a psychologist. And that taught me so much. I, I can tell you that university is just a paper that prepares you to do the real thing. It doesn't even prepare you too much. And mm -hmm. in three months of working on my own, I learned more than in the five years of university. So that's when I started seeing clients and understanding more about human nature. There's this joke that in, in Uruguay we say that 
surgeons have butcher complex because they like slicing meat. Well, psychologists have gossip complex. <laughs> we want to hear what's behind the curtain, what's in pe going on in people's lives that we don't actually get to see. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I, w I was given this full-on access pass to people's lives and people's stories and how they ate and how they related and how they had sex. Everything that you would never talk in a normal conversation, all of a sudden, it was open. And I could ask about anything. I would just, in the beginning, I would say, I, I even admit that many of the questions were just out of curiosity, not really because of therapeutic reasons. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, eventually that thirst gets gets satisfied you you're like okay okay now i can settle into into knowing the people's lives what happens behind the scenes and you start focusing more on the therapeutic side and what i started seeing there was that everybody was struggling roughly with the same things which in general was managing emotions dealing with their belief system and conflict with other people. That was, that was about it. Those were the reasons why, why they were going to therapy. It might manifest as I cannot relate to my teenage daughter or I might manifest as my relationship is falling apart. But what's behind is either lack of emotional intelligence or an inability to navigate your thoughts and your thinking or just plain mismatch of people that you're relating with. So yeah, I, I, I started seeing patterns and I, I felt like the more I was interviewing people, interviewing, <laughs> therapy, mm. <laughs> but I think in the beginning it was, it was more interviewing. Like, let's say for yeah. the first year, it was more like interviewing because Honestly, secretly, I had no idea what I was doing because <laughs> university doesn't yeah, prepare you. Everybody's doing the same. If they're starting <laughs> a business, everybody's bluffing, you know, but yes. I think it's a good way to start. <laughs> yes, exactly. You, mm. When you start any career, you, mm. you have the theoretical knowledge, but that doesn't apply because they can tell me like, oh, yeah, there's this belief system and stuff like that. But then in front of me, there's a person that is incredibly convinced that their their father ruined their life and what am i supposed to do with that um, mm -hmm. for the first time times i was just asking questions and winging it eventually yes eventually i was able to explain what a belief is and that if you think this way then you have a harder path ahead of you than if you think this other way so i was i was able to articul articulate myself better but in the beginning it was like that and i <laughs> stayed in there in therapy for about six years while well, simultaneously I had an HR job. So I was also having the, the stability. I was working for Upwork, you know, the freelancing oh, platform. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I use it a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Well, I worked yeah. for Upwork like as a talent agent helping with, mm. with their IT people, IT oh, freelancers. Wow. So that was, that was actually very helpful as well to to get me to continue to see behind the scenes of what what the human experience brings and i think one of the biggest learnings of that whole phase was we're all struggling with the same and there's patterns and there's almost like a manual to the human existence that you can distill all of the the basic elements that we all have in common and we have so much more in common than what we think and if you tweak those elements then your life will significantly improve it's like the Pareto principle there's 20 percent that if you change it's going to change 80 percent of your life so that's what really settled in those years of working as a therapist mm. yeah i really think like if you for example if a limiting belief or um or yeah, something similar is that they always have layers, you know, and also emotions have layers. And I think in the core, we all have the same problem. You just want to be seen, for example, you don't uh, really love yourself and that has layers, you know. Yeah. Um, 
do you have maybe an example for uh, something like this? Because maybe for the audience, it's really difficult to understand. Um, maybe you have an example from a client you helped? I have an example for, for mm -hmm. myself of how difficult it is to understand that other humans think completely differently and that everybody is living in their own world. So for the longest time, I knew this theoretically. It's one of the first things that you learn in psychology. And then you have personality psychology, which is the different personalities that are naturally present in a society, let's say. And um, you just learn that some people are more analytical. Some people are more emotional. Some people are more spiritual. And that everybody has their own way of being. But... What I was, what I was experiencing, like, I, that's what I knew cognitively. Oh, there's every, everybody's different. So I need to be a bit different with every person that I'm interacting with. But I hadn't quite embodied the understanding, like the deep understanding that somebody else is somebody else. <laughs> and it sounds so stupid because logically makes so much sense, but mm -hmm. When you think of everything that you believe, everything that you are, and you think of somebody else, you sort of, or at least this was my experience, I was thinking like, yeah, they're probably similar to me. They're probably having all, like, all of these different things, uh, allegedly or uh, in, in appearance, but internally, they're probably the same. And recently, my boyfriend went on a, on a man's retreat. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it was in Germany. It was yeah. in the middle of the woods. He would hang out with 40 other men. And uh, actually, Andreas, our mutual friend, is the one that was mm -hmm. creating this retreat. Oh, so nice. Yeah. So he went on that retreat. And then I was alone for the first time in a long time and oh. traveling around. I went back to the Netherlands and I was staying with friends. And... When I was in that trip, what I experienced was that my boyfriend was not with me physically. So then I, I felt completely separated from him. That, mm -hmm. that, that was a weird trauma response that I had. <laughs> that it's the, I call it the emotional peekaboo. The moment, like, if you're next to me, I believe that you love me. I believe we have a good relationship. Everything is fine. The moment that you're away and you're doing your own thing, I'm like, what? Is everything that we did a lie? And I started, I started feeling this really big separation from my boyfriend. Oh. And I thought it was because of something he did. I thought it was because he was not answering my texts or because he was not calling with me. And... This was for about two and a half weeks, almost three weeks. And I went into this grieving process of like, oh, our relationship is a lie and we will need to break up wow. because this cannot continue. And it was all things that I was interpreting from the fact that he was not answering the text as, as he usually would or his tone of voice was different because he was hanging out with 40 other men. So the testosterone is ridiculous. And so I was like, <laughs> exactly. who is this yeah. person? <laughs> yeah. I don't know this person. They transformed. He's so, a real man now. <laughs> yeah. He's the man and he only cares about his bros and his, our relationship is not existent. I don't know. I just started creating this story in my head hmm. that was fueled by evidence, quote unquote, evidence of he's treating me differently and he's speaking differently. So whatever we had before was a lie. And then I just started going into this insanity. So in my own head, to the point where when we talked again, a couple of weeks after, I was like, I was pretty sure we needed to break up. <laughs> that our thing was needed to be done because this, this was, there was not going to work. He, his true self was... <laughs> I, I, I was just so delusional. <laughs> I kept it together. I wasn't, wow. I wasn't ruining his trip. I wasn't being mm -hmm. hysterical about so you it. you kept it for yourself for the whole time. I kept it for myself, which also was not a great idea. And I would talk to friends that would 
almost amplify that. They would be like, yeah, yeah, no, that's totally it. Oh, yeah, he's totally weird. <laughs> I was like, yes. Nobody was telling me, like, you're tripping, girl. Like, just calm down. It's a good relationship. <laughs> it's going to be back and it's like, uh, going to be fine. So I think the point that I'm trying to make is the moment that we talked again, I could hear his perspective. And he was like, oh, yeah, no, we weren't allowed to have the phones. And honestly, I was so lost and so in my own trip that I couldn't hold your trip or I couldn't relate to you in that moment. But we're mm -hmm. solid. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Wow. So I went through hell and back just out of wow. my own creation. And I mm. created this whole crazy, insane story around what was going on. And it was just a matter of perspective. Mm. And my perspective was a seed that was, oh, he's a bit different. And then it started to grow, like fear was fueling that seed. And then it started to grow into this very grim and terrible tree mm -hmm. that I myself watered and nurtured. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I was confronting that internal reality with the outside, it was a realization that, oh, dude, oh, I was tripping. I was stripping hard. So <laughs> it was perfect. Everything was perfect as it was. And I suffered mm -hmm. a lot that week. I was like every day I was crying and I was in misery. Wow. But on the other side of that, there was this very deep understanding that even with the person that you think you know the most, you can create a lot of stories around and you can think that you understand them when in reality, no, mm -hmm. you're just projecting your own story outward. Mm -hmm. And this is really, 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 really shitty experience taught me that mm -hmm. and I love it and mm -hmm. even in the absolute darkness I was like I'm sure I'm sure this is for a reason <laughs> but I was so miserable honestly yeah. yeah you can also see it in a spiritual way that okay so it's like this now it's the end uh it, it meant to be like this I need to be alone but yeah relationships can be such a mirror mm -hmm. and that can be so interesting also for your personal development. Yeah. It's insane. Mm. It's insane because mm. you realize a lot of the things that things that the partner is doing is actually the things that you're projecting onto your partner. Mm -hmm. You're not doing that. Yeah. I was like, Oh, he's growing out and he's just finally free with his pack of wolves. That's like, what? No, he was just, <laughs> yeah. he was sleep deprived and tired. <laughs> And did he come back as a as a more masculine man, or yeah, was yeah. he the same? Also, he he had his own mm. trip, and then mm. he became a lot more integrated. Like it's it's for him to tell, of course, but he became mm. a lot of more integrated as a person because he allowed a lot mm. of the masculine aspects to be more present. Mm. And I was like, okay, if this is your best version. I can adapt to it and I, I actually like it. I appreciate it. But the moment of transition, the moment of transformation is really awkward for both of us because I was also mm -hmm. becoming more independent and stronger mm -hmm. and more rooted. This, this whole experience told me like, you can trust no one, <laughs> which was bullshit <laughs> later on. But mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. it, even from that wound origin, I was able to connect to the deeper core of myself and find mm -hmm. safety within. And I think that was mm -hmm. also one of the big learnings. So then when we came back together, he was more manly. He was safer within himself. I was more determined, more clear communicating, and also more safe within myself. So then as two separate mm -hmm. individuals, we were able to build back up our relationship or start almost like a new relationship as more integrated people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also feel like if a man is more in their masculine energy, it also allows the woman to be more in her feminine energy. And um, it has nothing to do with gender, but it's more like the, the feminine energy inside of you. We also have ma masculine energy, you know, like our, uh, thrive to have success, you know, and, uh, but we also have our feminine side where it's more in flow and just more soft, you know, and, um, if we 
talk about this time, the age of Aquarius, I really feel like we can be more in our feminine energy and embrace that, you know? Yeah. But I actually, in that time, I had a very interesting insight because I, I used to think that the feminine energy was softer and rounder and kinder and compassionate. And also saw the dark side of the feminine, which is the the overthinking and the going insane mm. and uh, erratic emotions out of control. Mm. But also I saw a side of the feminine energy that I hadn't seen before, which is when a woman is about to give birth, they're about to shoot up a, a four kilo baby out of their vagina. So it's mm. a very intense process. And it's almost like this rite of passage where the woman that used to be a person only caring about herself, she becomes responsible for another human being. And that process mm -hmm. of giving birth calls up a warrior within because you have mm -hmm. to handle pain like a motherfucker and you have to go through it. It's not like you're quitting halfway. It's like, oh, there's only a, an arm of the baby out. So I guess that's enough. <laughs> no, you have to see it through. You have to birth it. And there's mm -hmm. this energy of the feminine that is an unstoppable force for life mm -hmm. and for creation. So mm -hmm. I connected with that warrior within. To, to find the safety and to find a new way of walking on life. And connected with that side of the feminine energy, where the strong, the really strong, steady core that will go relentlessly after something mm -hmm. was brought to the surface. There is this beautiful analogy that I, an analogy now, like it's, like, it's like an interpretation of the yin and yang symbol that one is feminine, the other one is masculine. And it says that the masculine side is, uh, let's say that it's a black and white and the, 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 in the yin and yang symbol. And the white half is the feminine energy and the black center is the strong core. And for the masculine mm -hmm. is the strong outside. So the most, mostly is the, the black part is the, the strong and the white circle is the soft so mm. what i did in that yin and yang um, encounter was to yes i live in my feminine but also tapping into the strength of a woman mm. that creates and bring things to life mm. yeah yeah that's actually true yeah i never thought about that but it's it's like a balance you know, it has to be in balance, you know, and also for a man, you know, I think it's also really good for a man to cry sometimes, you know, and not always be so like, oh, I need to be tough. I need to be a man, you know, it's good to let go emotions. And I think for a woman it's also attractive, you know, if a man is more emotional sometimes, you know, and more in touch with her feelings. Uh, do you have kids yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want to, do, you, do you want to have kids? Um. Yeah, I think so. I think so in a, in a few mm. years. I didn't want to, but then mm. I took ayahuasca and then ayahuasca told me I had to. Oh, ayahuasca. Okay, let's talk about that because that's also really interesting. <laughs> How was that experience for you? Did you, so, did you see yourself born again? Because a lot of people have this experience where they see the self like... Uh... Okay. So a, a bit of context. It's like a, it's a. I didn't yeah. see myself born again, but I okay. was. It was a rebirth experience, in a okay. way. Okay. So this was in when I was visiting Peru, and mm. I went to a retreat center that was in the middle of the jungle. I got guided there by a dream. It was all very magical, very mystical, a whole experience, and um, mm. I went there for a retreat that was five days and then there was two ayahuasca settings so the, the way that it goes is that you're going to the retreat you do cleansing rituals you work with the shaman in order to get you ready for the ayahuasca ceremony and then the ayahuasca ceremony itself is at night and you you take one cup of this very powerful medicine that tastes like medicine because it's very not nice on the mouth yeah. 
And uh, it because it was in the middle of the jungle and it was this thousands year old lineage with this wonderful, incredibly powerful shaman. She was a woman. It was a very thick, loaded, charged medicine. It was insane. So it's not what you would usually get maybe somewhere else where it has to be a bit watered down and stuff. No, this was the, the, the thickest thing. So I, I took that and the first sitting, the first um, ceremony, I completely let go of myself. So I was just blasted out into the universe and I was seeing oneness and I was finally seeing reality, let's say. And uh, it felt that I had awakened to something that has been in front of me the whole time. There was this voice that was constantly telling me, remember, remember, remember. And there was like this visual image of a, an eternal rain, like spiral full of made out of tiny rainbows. And that was the universe. And that's what I, what the image that the visual image that I had of the universe was like, you are everything. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? Classic. <laughs> yeah. But it was insane because the moment that it kicked in, I was, and this is where most people struggle, where they are like, I don't want to let go of my ego. I don't want to let go of the person that I am. I want to hold on to my reality. I was like taking the shoes off like, the entrance of the house, you know, like, no problem. Let's forget about Carolina. Fuck that girl. Who's that? Mm -hmm. I don't care. <laughs> so then I just went into this other universe where I had no identity and I could experience very freely all of the spiritual lessons that I had been hearing up to that moment. So wow. the, for example, the, the, we're all one, we're all walking each other home. You have, you have to be unconditionally loving, like all of these things that you know, intellectually again, because knowing intellectually is not the same as knowing in your body and in your soul. And what Ayahuasca was doing was teaching me in my body and in my soul, what these things meant what they really meant. So that was, that was a very big ceremony where I was, it was so beautiful. I, I, I didn't feel bad at any point. It was not a bad trip by any means. There's no bad trips on ayahuasca because it's medicine. You know, it's not, it's not, you don't do it for fun. You do it for healing. But in that mm -hmm. case, it was, it was very clear that the mission with, with that sitting was to, make me embody all of this spiritual teachings that I had been reading about and preaching even shamefully because I, I hadn't completely integrated them. I still mm. haven't clearly because there's no, mm. there's no completely integrating, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was the first sitting and the second sitting was more about me. Like it didn't, it didn't erase my identity. Like in the first one, the second one was more, of what's my path forward? What's my path moving forward? And I was very attached to the idea of being a speaker. And I was like, okay, I want to know what the path is for being a speaker. And I came with an agenda to the sitting, which I always get doesn't like. And like, you can have an intention, but don't be too tight about it. Don't be too attached to it. Mm -hmm. Just trust the journey. Yeah. And I talk about ayahuasca as if it's like your grandma <laughs> and she is, she, she's like, it's almost like you enter grandma's house and she's showing you stuff and telling you stuff, but you have to behave by the rules of the house. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, and that's in that ceremony, there was like this, this kind of on and off beginning where I was not really surrendering fully because I wanted to remember my intention. I wanted to remember what I came there for. And then I was, was giving me like shitty visuals, like a boat in the ocean. And I was like, oh, is there more to it? No, there was nothing. It was just a boat floating. And I was watching this Japanese painting, painting of a, an umbrella. And it's like, oh, look at it. And nothing, nothing was happening. It was just visuals of something. And then eventually... I was asking, I was, um, 
like, okay, what's going on? And that time I had taken less of a cup because last time I was blasted off so far into space that I completely forgot who I was. So this time I was like, okay, I have less and I'll try to remain a bit myself. Mm -hmm. So I had a bit less than the normal cup. And then Ayahuasca would, would tell me, you don't trust me. You took less. And I was like, <laughs> what? Is this the reason why you're giving me the shitty visuals? And oh, yeah. yeah. And it was like almost like offended at me that I didn't. Like, of course, she's, she's not offended, but like playing a game. It's like this, mm -hmm. this, this, this game with me. And I was like, of course I trust you. Of course I fully trust you. Okay. And in that moment, because the things that happen in the Maloka, which is the place where you take ayahuasca, they are just bananas. My shaman was telling me, Carolina, do you want more? <laughs> and I was like, yes, shaman. Yes. yes. You Let's heard take it. another shot. <laughs> what? Let's take another shot. Let's take another shot. And then I took more. <laughs> and then I was, it was again, taking me on the trip of my dreams. And I completely let go of my intention. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah forget about it. I'm, I'm here to, to talk to you. I'm not to, to talk to you. I was speaking to, I was, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not here to push my agenda on this. And, mm -hmm. uh, the funny thing was that she ended up showing me the whole career that I could have. And it started off with me sitting on stage or standing on stage. And she, she was telling me, claim it, claim it, put roots on it. So then you feel like you're mm -hmm. home. And anytime you're on stage, you're at home. And she was teaching me how to claim that reality for myself. She took me to a place where almost like in a quantum world where I could ground that thing that I wanted as a dream. And then she was putting me in front of people. Like she filled up the stadium, the stadium, the room. In, the, in that case, it was a tiny room. And then she put me in a bigger room and in a bigger room. And I, it was showing me, me speaking, me feeling the speaking, me filling up the stadium. And at some point, it put something in my belly and I was like the fuck you doing I started so scary yes <laughs> I was and it was it was like this feeling that I had something like light in me like like something bright inside my my belly and I was like what what is this What's happening? And I was speaking on stage and I, like, I kept on speaking, but I could feel that my belly was growing and growing and growing. And then I noticed I was pregnant. And oh. I was like... I thought it was about the fears. I thought no. you, you were having be uh, belly pain because of the fear. Oh, okay, no. now I understand. Yeah, no, okay. it wasn't. It was a freaking baby. And I was like, what are wow. you doing? Like the moment I realized, I was like, no, 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 no. We're not putting this into the quantum reality because it's not what I want. And then like she was, she, she kept on, on doing it. And then she, she took me through the whole pregnancy and I kept on working mm -hmm. up until a certain point. And like, it, it was all of that. And then when I was fully pregnant, I experienced the birth. Like I experienced it spiritually. Like I didn't have contractions in my body but I could feel the spiritual side of it of giving birth and then the moment that I had the baby in my arms I started crying because the love that I was feeling for that creature was nothing mm -hmm. that I ever experienced before so it was this explosion of emotion that I didn't know was possible like my ability to feel love expanded 40 times because of that image of the baby. And I could not stop crying. And the sham shaman was worried that I was going through a bad trip. And she, she came over and she was smoking, um, like blowing tobacco on me because it's something that they do to cleanse. And she was singing me songs mm. and stuff. And I was like, I was just crying out of happiness and love and wow. insane possibilities. And, um, then in that moment, I, I finally stopped fighting it. And I was like, okay, yeah, I get it. I get what you mean. Like, this is really lovely. Like, this is lovely. And it showed, and I was like, okay, show me more of it. And then it started showing me a house in the countryside. It was a tiny house. Mm -hmm. And I was with my partner. 
uh, Julian. And uh, we were so happy with that baby. Like It was such a loving family, such a beautiful mm. feeling. And I was like, oh, my God, I was like, are you really going to make me have a baby? <laughs> but it showed me so much mm -hmm. happiness. And she told me something that I tell my clients all the time. And I, I don't I never meant it that much as she meant it to me. And it, she told me you can have it all. I was just mm. aiming for a good career. I was just aiming mm. for impact. But then she told me, you can also have the family. You can also have the love. You can also have the life of your dreams or even beyond your dreams. Mm. Because what you can dream is limited, but I can show you. I can show you more. Mm. And I was like, oh God, okay. Okay, I'll I'll think about it's it. It's a lot of information. <laughs> it's a lot of information. I had to like I had to be able to hold that happiness, which mm -hmm. I could notice that my body was not prepared to hold that much happiness, that much love, that much potential. Mm -hmm. And then I I was saying I was telling Ayahuasca, okay. Okay, I'll think about it. I'll seriously consider this thing of having a family. I'll consider it. <laughs> I'll consider it. You made a great point. But you have to tell my boyfriend because he thinks that we're not having a family. Uh -huh. And my boyfriend was not in the retreat that time. He went to Ayahuasca next, like the, the next week. He was in a hotel 30 kilometers away. I was in the middle of the jungle. He was in a city. And uh, he mm -hmm. was like still in the middle of a work week. <laughs> And, and then doing ayahuasca, wow. And I was in ayahuasca. No, he was he was mm. he was fine. Like he was working remotely. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. I thought he was working and doing ayahuasca. No, 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 no. 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 That's the best combination. <laughs> no, not really. You cannot really concentrate. But um, but yeah, he was doing his own thing. He hadn't tried ayahuasca ever in his life before. And that night, he had a dream. He doesn't, doesn't usually remember his dreams, and he had never had a dream like this. And it was that I was pregnant and I was coming into the porch of a house and telling, like, I, I don't know, telling him something about it. And he looked at me and I was pregnant and he was like, oh, that's nice. Like, it's the most normal thing in the world. And he was very oh. happy with that dream. And when I told him, like, Ayahuasca told me I have to have a baby. Like, and it's something that it was a shock to him because it was like, it's not something that I would say. But simultaneously, he was relieved because he actually wanted to have a family. And he just had that dream where Ayahuasca just mm -hmm. showed him in the same night. Wow. Like He never had a dream before. And in the same night, he had that dream and he was completely okay with it, happy with it. And I was like, okay, fuck, I guess we have to have a family now. Jesus. <laughs> So many things to do. You need to be a motivational speaker, then having a family. It's a lot. <laughs> All of the potential mm. that one life has. And then it showed me. And um, yeah, I think I think it was a very intense experience. But it, this all came from the question, do you want to have kids? And I was like, mm. I didn't <laughs> until I was made a proposal I couldn't refuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The universe had another plan for you. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you came home after this ayahuasca trip. And um, did you already knew, like, okay, I want to be a motivational speaker? Or were you already, like, doing some public speaking? Uh, what was your yeah. plan? Yeah, I've been wanting to do this for maybe 10 years. But I didn't mm. see it as a possibility when I was living in Uruguay. Nobody was a speaker. And um, there was no career path towards it. And I made it intentional about, it was a, a year and a half ago, a little, a little bit um, less than a year and a half ago, I made it really intentional. Okay, now I'm going for it. Because before I was mm -hmm. building up for it, I was getting the, my mind right. I didn't want to, and I, I was very clear on this, I didn't want to start speaking until I had a coherent enough mind that I can trust it to take people on a journey and not take them to a dumpster or to, to shit places. <laughs> I, I wanted to be grounded and have clear ideas. So that was like about a year and a half ago. And after Ayahuasca, I was like, okay, I'm getting started really now. So that kickstarted it. 
and it showed me the possibilities. But in order to get to the to being a speaker, you need to. It's like any business. You need to build an image. You need to build a network. You need to build credibility. And um, that was at zero, <laughs> because as being a mm -hmm. psychologist, I was working by word of mouth. I wasn't advertising myself in any way. So I had to learn business from scratch. I had to learn how to articulate myself in a way that people would understand. So I had to simultaneously learn all of these different things that are skills, like business skill and speaking skill, while simultaneously growing in the mindset, as I was saying, like my, the mindset that took me to be a psychologist and be stable in psychology and in human resources is not going to take me to become a, an international speaker. So then I had to adjust a lot of my mindset. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've been doing in the past year and a half. And it took about, let's say, because I was still traveling then. So after Peru, I went to Colombia and then I went to Argentina and then I went to Uruguay and then just came to Spain in March. And then that's when I was like, okay, I'm grounded. I'm somewhere. I'm going to start to build a network and I'm going to become a speaker now in person because before I was doing it online, but it's not the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's when things started to take off and I started to meet people and I started to have more events. So I'm, I would say that I'm still pretty early in my career, but that I have a clear, a, not a clear, clear is not the word, but I have a knowing of the next steps that I need to take in order to get where I want to go, mm. which is the, the big stages and uh, the, yeah, just, just sharing messages in front of big crowds. But yeah, I'm still in the beginning. So like the crowds are 50 people, 100 people. It's not thousands yeah. just yet. <laughs> but I but I saw you speaking in Malaga and yeah, you're really good and also really good in storytelling. And the the talk was also about storytelling. And I don't know how you engage with the audience and everything. It, it seems so natural, you know, when I saw you there. So um But I think a lot of people still have the fear to speak to the audience. Um, what can people do to, um, yeah, to regulate this fear or to speak for a large audience? Do you have maybe some tips or maybe things you do before you go on stage? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have to put that one in a bit into context because I, mm -hmm. I usually say that there's four stages of speaking. The first stage is survival where you just get on stage or you're given a mic and you say whatever comes out of your mouth but you don't really know what it is and then you black out and you get out as fast as possible from that stage and you don't remember what happened mm -hmm. that's the survival stage and for that stage which a lot of people are the thing is you have to do it very intentionally you have to know what you are going to say and you have to practice it before going because you know that you, your brain will black out, will, will bail on you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. at least have it automated, whatever you're going to say, have it automated or have some slides that are going to help you through. But mm -hmm. the survival phase, you can only get through by practice. And um, just get out there, do it, and eventually you will go to the next phase, which is the phase that needs a lot of validation. I call it the validation phase, where you're more present on stage. You have a bit more skill on how to present, but if you get any negative feedback or if you, if the crowd is not reacting or reacting the way that you want, or things are not going as planned, you can easily feel affected because you're tying your worth to how well a talk goes. And like, this is, this is a phase where my tip there would be also to prepare, become prepared and uh, slowly but surely start to listen with a more neutral tone to the feedback that you're getting or to the things that you're actually doing. Not just needing the approval, but also listening to the feedback for improvement. And um, for the third stage, 
the, that comes right after that one is the ownership is when you're on stage and you own your presence and you own what you're doing, you feel good in that place. And uh, it's not so much that you need the good feedback anymore or the bad, like it's, it's, it's fine. Like you're more neutral, you're more confident about your thing. So in that phase, the tip is keep on growing, keep on going. Don't stop there mm -hmm. because the fourth stage is transformation. And transformation is when you step on stage and you make people get transformed by just mm -hmm. being on your talk. That your, their life was one way before and it becomes another way when you finish your talk. And in, in that, like, you can see the speakers that are in that place, which is, for example, Oprah. Oprah opens her, her mouth and she's so full of compassion. She's so transformative herself that her presence... Mm -hmm is going to help you get to different levels and to explore different things or create a setting where you feel so safe and so seen that you're allowed to dream bigger. And that's the transformative aspect of it. So if you are in transformative, keep on going and keep on growing, have your practices and go deeper within yourself so you can go deeper with an audience. But I would say that the tips vary depending on where you are in your journey. Yeah. In general, mm -hmm. just don't have a scripted thing and build towards good public speaking. Don't expect to be good mm -hmm. on the first time. It's for anything mm -hmm. in business. It's like, oh, I start my yeah. first business and I hope I make millions on the first run. And it's, no, no. The, the, in, if you want to do that, you need to mm -hmm. level up your whole system, yourself so much before you get to have the millions. And it's the same with speaking and it's the same with everything. Mm -hmm. Just be okay with sucking. <laughs> sucking and not in a sexual yeah. way <laughs> but in a <laughs> yeah. be okay with being mm -hmm. shitty for a while until you become better yeah 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 that's how life is and also starting a business you know you you fall five times and you get up six times and then you have success you know it's all about going through all the bullshit and then achieving your goal you know exactly so uh yeah but people also can learn about public speaking uh with you right yes yes i mm -hmm. recently in my in my discovery of what i was doing i i noticed i wanted to also be an entrepreneur and i tried a bunch of businesses before but without much success and i finally landed an idea that was true to me that was true to my journey and that also was a good business need. Like there was a need in the market mm -hmm. for it, which is helping people prepare a talk. So mm -hmm. I created this, this course, which is three weeks long, that people just go on a journey from zero or from like a very, very modest draft of a talk to an awesome talk. So we go everything from mm -hmm. strategy to content to delivery. And the, the person just has mm -hmm. this confidence because they know what they're talking about. Now <laughs> they, they have, a, they, they know where they want to take the audience. They know why the audience is there. A, a lot of things that normally you wouldn't pay attention to, then you're like walked. Like I take you by the hand and I walk you in it. So mm -hmm. it's not just that I'm speaking and I am being a speaker as in my profession, but also I'm helping other people become speakers or have awesome talks if they just have one off talk a one off talk then yeah let's make it awesome as much as possible right because still repetition is going to make you way better but let's make you as good as it can this time so so that's what i'm doing mm -hmm. now and i'm coaching people individually and in groups so that's that's the mm -hmm. the current business so nice and um uh, we already <laughs> over an hour it went so fast um i would like to wrap it up for now uh but before we leave if anybody is interested in working with carolina you can go to carolinagreno.com right that's yeah. correct or just okay. hit me up on my instagram which is also carolina greno just okay perfect yeah. i will put all the links in the description uh, but before we leave, do you have some nice words or knowledge to share with the audience? The common topic throughout the podcast has been there's layers, there's levels to this. So if you are in a level where you feel 
that it's not the place for you, that there's more to life than, than this, then get ready and buckle up. Because the moment that you make up your mind that you want to jump to the next level, it's going to get gnarly. But do it anyways, because your soul is asking for it. I feel that sometimes we get, we get scared of exploring our potential, exploring who we can be in public speaking, who we can be in business, who we can be as people or in relationships. And we don't go after it. But what Ayahuasca, what Ayahuasca told me was just everything is up for grabs. You can have it all. So don't settle for something because it's comfortable. Go for the next thing. And no, it's not going to be easy, but let's normalize it not being easy because that's, that's everything in life. You're going to have to iterate. You're going to have to work for it. But the, what's on the other side waiting for you is fulfillment, it's growth, it's love for the journey, and it's a life worth living. So honestly, nobody in their deathbed said, oh, too bad, I took a chance, too bad, I went all in. Mm -hmm. But they do say the opposite. Mm -hmm. So don't be that person that doesn't go mm -hmm. for their dreams and their mm -hmm. best life. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Carolina. And I will see you at the next event soon, I guess. Or you're going to travel. I'm going to travel for a little bit. while, yeah. but then I'll be back. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I will join your talks again. <laughs> nice. Yes, thank you so much. And I will see everybody in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Unapologetically Joy. Don't forget to subscribe on my YouTube channel and I will really appreciate it if you leave a nice comment. And if you are listening on Spotify, don't forget to press the follow button and leave five stars because it really helps me. So thank you so much and I will see you in the next episode.